hear about alternative conflict resolution from someone in the field. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Corey. That's really not necessary. <laughs> so Corey asked me to talk about how I became to be um, a facilitator and then maybe talk about some cases when it works. And so I've come up with three cases um, to chat about for a little bit. Um, so first, me. Um, I am what is known as an environmental f washout. I thought I wanted to be an environmentalist when I left college and um, went to work. Um, so I have a master's degree in public administration and environmental law. Um, and I thought I would go and work for like the EPA, change the world. I worked for the EPA for a while and wow, did that suck. Um, <laughs> It was at a time when the federal government was not real excited about environmental law and implementing it, um, and I found that very discouraging, and morale at EPA was, this was sort of during the Bush years, um, really low and really not fun. Um, so I failed at that. And then um, I went to work for the Wilderness Society as the public lands intern. And um, I liked the topic a lot. Um, there's a part of me that is so fascinated by the way we manage and use our federal public lands that I thought, ha ha, this is the job for me. Um, and in the course of that, uh, that job, people often said to me, um, so what I'm gonna need for you to do is do some research so that we can sue the X and such energy company or the X and such that thing company. And um, I started to ask questions like, so, could we just maybe call them and ask them like, not to do the thing that we don't want them to do? <laughs> and what people said to me both explicit, implicitly and then once actually explicitly is, yeah, that's not really what we do here. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> then I shouldn't be here. Um, but what happened as part of my job at the Wilderness Society is the Wilderness Society was a party to a facilitated um, conflict, which was the Northwest Colorado Stewardship. And so as part of my little intern duties, I went to those meetings, and I saw the gal get up and run those meetings, and I thought, holy cats, that gal's got my dream job. And so because of the time I was working on a PhD in collaborative resource management, um, I went and said, so I'll work for you for free. Do anything that you want. Teach me. And she said, well, great, because I'm understaffed, and I have nothing to pay you. And I was like, well, great. Um, so I went to work for uh, Christy Parker Selico at the Keystone Center, which is a big facilitation house here in the West. Um, as an unpaid intern. Um, I worked unpaid for six months, and then somewhere along the way, I, they decided I didn't suck too much, so then they hired me and I became an associate, and then eventually um, worked there and had my own cases. Um, I will tell you that breaking into the environmental facilitation field is tricky. There are a lot of people who do this work, a lot of big facilitation firms, a lot of you know, small firms like mine and like one-shot folks out there in the world, but it can be done, um, and it's really, really fun. Is um, that enough of my background? Okay, so my job, as you probably have guessed, day to day, day, I just go to meetings. That's all I do. Um, the great thing is I only go to meetings that I'm running, so that helps a lot, because meetings I'm not running I find suck. Um, so what I feel that my job is, is to help a group um, find their way to an agreement. Sometimes um, that is a very hands-on job, where I have to be very, very bossy and tell people, you need to stop talking, it's not your turn. And sometimes groups just kind of find a natural collaborative vibe really easily, and I don't need to do that. Then I just help them by finding, um, offering creative solutions and other type things. Um, what you will find if you meet other people who do what I do is we all define the job differently. Um, I believe that, my, that I'm a catalyst, I'm a tool. Um, processes are not about me. I should be willing and able to fade into the background when the group's doing just fine without me, but I should also be willing and able to get in there with them if they need my help. And um, if I gotta put someone in a headlock and get them out of that conversation, I'm prepared to do that as well. Different facilitators do those different things to varying degrees of success and comfort, and everyone sort of finds their own voice and their own way to do it, um, and people succeed in, and do it so differently than the way that I do it. Um, one of the tools that I bring to my, to my work is humor. Uh, what I find is people who are fighting about something really hard um, get tired of sitting in a room being very serious and dour and divisive. So one, my style, just because it's my personality, it's not particularly deliberate, um, is I bring a fair amount of humor to the table. It seems to disarm people. It um, makes the meeting itself just a little less unpleasant. Um, and it also allows me to kind of call people's behavior out because I'll make fun of myself a little bit first 
So then when I say, and I'm going to need for you just to stop talking, we all go, people laugh, and it's, people perceive it less as a personal attack and more as a, oh, this is what we're doing here now. Um, again, other people don't do that. The gal who trained me actually told me on my first day, Heather, you can be funny or you can be a facilitator, but you cannot be both. And um, what I have found is that if I weren't funny, I would be a really crappy facilitator. Um, so when does collaboration work? Um, so if you look at the, the word collaboration, it's co-labor. Um, it's a lot of work. It's working together. Collaboration is most successful when, um, when the parties need an agreement in order to get what they want. Um, you read Fisher and Uri, right? So um, this is the, if you have a good alternative to a negotiated agreement, um, you don't have a good incentive to negotiate. Um, if you have a bad alternative to a facilitated or negotiated agreement, then you have a good incentive to negotiate. Um, parties, I will often talk to my clients who are agencies, and I will say things like, so, what are we trying to accomplish? Why are we trying to accomplish that? Who are the parties, and why on earth would they come to this table? And we talk a little bit about that. What are we trying to accomplish, um, and why are the two most important questions that I will ask every agency that I work for? Um, sometimes what we're trying to accomplish is a performance theater of community engagement and problem solving so the agency can do whatever they want to do anyway. Those people don't generally um, pay me for very long because I'm a little bit too honest and say that's not really a great thing to do with your public engagement so we didn't do that. Um, but understanding the point, the goal of the collaborative exercise is really important. Um, clients, agencies sometimes have a hard time thinking about this. We're all say, so we're going to have a stakeholder group. That sounds fun. I love a good stakeholder group. What are we going to have them do? Collaborate. Well, yes, I had assumed that, but specifically collaborate about what? Energy policy, prairie chicken policy, whatever it might be. OK, that sounds, again, very, very interesting. But specifically, what's the question? What's the thing? What do you want them to do? And agencies often give me this kind of deer in the headlights look. I don't know what you mean. Do we want them to agree on a series of guidelines that we're going to hold all future operators, be they ranchers or um, oil and gas producers, to adhere to? Do we they want them to, um, to agree to areas, spatial allocation of, of uses? Over here we can do mountain biking. Over here we will have no mountain biking. Here we will have dogs, and here we will have no dogs. Asking these questions often helps the agency sort of figure out exactly what they want, because then my next question is, and how will you use that information? So we're going to get them to agree to a thing about a thing, and then you're going to do what with that thing? Is it going to be a new management plan? Is it going to be the foundation of all future management of this particular piece of land? Is it going to be, for example, in the Colorado Water Plan? In which case it will be this sort of ambition that we all share about how to do things better in the Colorado policy world related to water. Um, will it have regulatory authority? Will it have just the weight of the community's interest and commitment to it? These are all questions that must be answered. And when we're not clear about that, collaborations don't go very well. Um, if we kind of muddle through and we kind of guess, or we have this vague sense of what we're talking about, uh, groups will, will engage in that conversation. But eventually, they get wound around this, what the hell are we doing, Axel? Um, where they say, but wait, I thought we were Xing. No, 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 we're doing Y. And then you, spend, you lose time, you lose collaborative momentum re-clarifying what the purpose is because we, didn't, we weren't clear about that in the, in the beginning. Um, so I like a really clear goal for a group. We succeed when we have one. Next one is we need people to have that incentive to negotiate. Right? This is, the, this is the, the BATNA issue. If you have a good BATNA, you don't have a good incentive. We want everyone at the table, including the agency who has convened the conversation to have an incentive to, partic to participate in that discussion. Um, next thing is these personalities. It turns out that collaborations um, aren't a guarantee of success, and that some people just really fail in this environment. Some people are constitutionally ill-suited to collaborative problem solving. Sticky personalities can be very, very um, challenging for collaborative outcomes. And many resor natural resource issues in particular have very strong personalities. Um, these are your rancher turned community commissioner, county commissioner type person. These are your um, environmentalists who first saved you know, the rainforest in Ecuador and now is here to save whatever the thing is near you. Um, 
really strong personalities can make it very tricky to get success. Creativity. Um, people are accustomed to doing the win-lose, the trading off um, of solutions. Um, we have this much space, we need a place for bikes and a place for no bikes, we'll just divide that bad boy in half, call it good. Um, that is a way to solve a solution, right? That is distributive justice um, and not integrative problem solving. Um, in order to get to integrative problem solving where we figure out a way that we can all get our interests met together, we need someone in the room to be creative. Someone to say, yeah, but what if we did this? How about this? Um, sometimes that's my job, is to be the person who can think differently because I haven't been sitting in that office, in that cubicle for that many years. I haven't been in your agency. I don't live in your community. I've seen, th I've seen things out in the world and therefore can bring different perspectives. Um, sometimes that's someone else's job. Sometimes there's someone in the group who's been like thinking about this issue forever and they're like, oh my God, here it comes. Are you ready? Here's my awesome idea. But you need creativity to get to good solutions um, in most, if not all, um, natural resource conflicts. This should be integration, not fragmentation. Um, so integrative thinking, if you've read, again, the Fisher and Uri, uh, Uri book, you've um, talked about positions and interests. We have people identify their interests because when we have interests, we see that they're, um, they're cross-cutting across sectors, that your interests might overlap with your interests. Um, and so we want solution, a solution set, a world, where we can integrate all of those interests. If we piece out solution pieces and say, let's just talk about bikes, and then we'll talk about dogs, and then we'll talk about natural resources over here, and we fragment those topics, we've actually isolated, siloed, all the topics out and we've um, limited the ability to do that cross-cutting interest-based solution. Natural resource agencies make this mistake all the time. They'll say, no, 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 no. First, we're going to talk about the bugs and bunnies. Then we'll talk about the water. Then we'll talk about the view sheds. And they, say, they stage them or they sequence them in a way that absolutely precludes that integrative thinking. Um, agency capacity is an important factor in success. So all of my clients, with one or two exceptions, are municipalities, counties, um, state agencies, or federal agencies. And they are staffed by actual human people. And actual human people bring their actual human people problems into a collaborative environment. So an agency that is understaffed will have a hard time supporting a robust collaboration process. Um, agencies that have the resource biologist who got promoted to be the planter, the planner, and that person is now leading the planning process but doesn't have the skills or the education to do that, they're going to be hamstrung here. Um, the other piece is, um, so I'm working on a Forest Service project right now, and the Forest Service does this great thing. If you work there, you should be excited about this. Um, you get to do this thing called detailing. Well, they'll send you around, you do like, you work six months over there, and then you come here and you work six months over here, and you get to learn all these new things and bring all your skills to these different areas, which is awesome for you as an employee and for the, um, for the Forest Service. It is absolute crap for a collaborative enterprise. Because what happens is people build a relationship with the person at the agency, and then that person's like, so this has been real, but I'm taking off to Montana, I'll see y'all later. And then we have this new person come in, and now the agency doesn't have this collaborative capacity because we have a new body who has, doesn't have our shared history in the group. We've got to ramp that person up. And in the meantime, everyone else who was already ramped up, super bored, really frustrated, really um, discouraged, and you lose a little bit of the collaborative momentum. So the way that agencies are managed, the way they're funded, the way they're staffed, has as huge implications for collaborative success. And I find it most annoying because I don't have any control over it. I can kind of influence some of this stuff, that one, I got nothing. Um, politics. Politics can be a good thing for a collaborative mm -hmm. exercise or it can be a bad thing. Um, politics is good when it works to our advantage up here as an incentive. People want to want to find a deal, find a solution, because otherwise they'll get voted out of office. Their team, whatever their team is, will get voted out of office. Or someone's running for something and is looking for a nice political um, soundbite. I spearheaded the collaborative problem-solving thing on that topic. Yay, vote for me. Um, politics can be very tricky when uh, members of your group have a connection to a higher authority. 
Um, so when people can do an end run around a process, because in Colorado, I don't know if you know this already, everyone knows someone who is in some kind of an elected office. Everyone knows a city councilman, a county commissioner, someone at a, in a, who's a, a director of someone at, something at the state. Everyone knows something. And so when people know those people, particularly when they're elected officials, and they can run around the process and say, instead of negotiating with you people, like I'm pretending to do, I'm actually going to secretly go to my friend who happens to be the Secretary of the Interior. We went to high school together, don't you know? And I'll just have old Secretary of the Interior just fix this problem for me. That undermines a collaborative exercise as well. Um, clear rules. I added this one since, um, as I've been thinking about it. In addition to having a clear goal, here's what we're doing. We need clear goals about how we're going to do that. Um, this would be a group developing some kind of a decision-making protocol document. We're going to agree by consensus or we're not. If we're going to agree by consensus, we must first um, agree on what we mean by that consensus because I assure you, if there are 10 people in a room, there are 20 definitions of consensus. Um, and we need to decide who gets to participate in the decision-making. Anybody who shows up that day, anyone wearing a blue shirt that day, people who represent funders, people who represent implementers of policy, who gets to participate? Um, every time that I have failed to have clear rules on the decision-making protocols, uh, I have gotten hamstrung in a way that I've had a hard time fixing. Really important there. Um, facilitation is great if you have a good facilitator. A good facilitator can help a group get unstuck by being creative, by being bossy or not bossy, by doing some behind-the-scenes coaching. Um, lots of great things a facilitator can do. A crappy facilitator can have the exact opposite effect, can drain the energy out of a room, can make people feel that the process is biased. Um, a lot of resource agencies will try to use a, an internal person to be their facilitator. That person went to facilitation school, they took the 40 hours of training, and they don't understand why people are thinking the process is biased. When you have someone who has a clear interest in the conversation, even if they have the best of intentions, attempting to facilitate a group, um, folks tend to think that that um, sets a process off on the wrong foot. Some people think that facilitators uh, don't need to be issue neutral. Um, I've heard, I have several colleagues and friends um, who say, well, I mean, I personally have a thought about how we should solve this problem, but I can perform this thing called neutrality as I um, uh, discharge my facilitation duties. I find that I'm not that good of an actress and that if I actually have an opinion, it's going to come out. I can't fake it that well. So for myself, I think that if I have an opinion about how this problem should be solved, I should not be working on this issue. So to me, facilitation is, it goes hand in hand with issue neutrality, but there is a fair amount of contention about that point in the field. So the other two things I'm going to talk about here are the end of these stories. One is the success of the, negotiated, the, the negotiation that I facilitated. And then down here, I'm going to talk to you a little about, about what happened after that. Because it turns out that time doesn't stop just because I, cut, you know, I cashed the last check and I left. The world carries on. And sometimes that builds on the successes of my collaborative groups. And sometimes it undermines um, or works against those successes. And I have had um, some interesting experiences in these projects that I'm excited to tell you about. Yep. Yep. Questions so far? All right, away we go. So my first case, um, back when I met Corey. This is a Northwest Colorado stewardship. Um, this was a BLM project up in Moffat County, so extreme northwest corner of the state. BLM was um, writing a new resource management plan for the Little Snake Field Office. And um, someone had the grand idea to get a, com a, a group of stakeholders together and see if, while BLM worked on the official BLM alternatives in the NEPA analysis, um, generically by me called the Save the Environment and the Rape and Pillage and the thing we're actually going to do instead of those two things alternatives, um, someone said, we should get the stakeholders together and see if they could crack this nut in a different way. What a spectacular idea. It was great. The goal was so clear. The goal was get this group to write a community alternative, and if they did it, it would be analyzed by BLM and included in the NEPA analysis and could potentially become the preferred alternative. Incentive to negotiate. So here you have your environmentalists. You have the energy companies. Turns out there's a nice pile of natural gas up there. Unfortunately, it is also located underneath 
some really spectacular natural resources up on top, um, some scenic resources, um, some, uh, it turns out, sage grouse habitat, and all kinds of other fun stuff up there. Um, this is up in Moffat County. Uh, they have a tendency towards sort of your sagebrush rebellion. Our federal public lands, we should own them, get the government out, we should be able to do whatever we want. Um, so the county was a participant in that group. Uh, there's wild horses on BLM lands and people want them to be free, except for the people that call them escaped livestock and want them to be corralled and possibly shot and maybe eaten. Um, so lots of stakeholders there. Did they have an incentive to negotiate? In some cases, yes. You want BLM to have the best plan possible. If you participate in the plan and can influence it so that the rules are whatever you think the rules ought to be, if you're an energy company, that helps you because maybe you, you've swayed the rules a little bit toward more um, permissive leasing or something like that. If you're an environmental company, you might be over here saying, trying to influence things toward more protection, um, more restrictive leasing, things like that. Um, motorized recreation, they had an incentive because they wanted more access to the area. Horse folks, they just wanted BLM to protect the horses and they thought they were at the, the table to hold the line against all those other people with the shoot and kill. Um, so, for the most part, people appeared on the surface to have an incentive to negotiate, except for this sticky wicket down here, politics. And it turns out that several of our people up in here actually did go to high school with the current Secretary of the Interior. And so what they would say is, oh yeah, I'm here to deal, no, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reasonable. And then when any given meeting didn't go their way, they would go home and call the old Secretary and say, you really got to put a stop to this, this is ridiculous. Or you need to tell BLM staff to rein it in this way or push it this other way. Um, we had very clear rules that said that you couldn't do that. We did not have very clear rules about what would happen if you did. It said, thou shalt not, and then it was sort of implied, uh, please. <laughs> um, so now I'm here, my, my personalities. This was a great, great personality. They're, they're, they're still great. Um, so a couple of examples, there's a rancher up in Moffat County um, who was a, a previous county commissioner and is sort of a, a leader in natural resource kind of stuff statewide, depending on who you ask. Um, he's the one who knew uh, the, the Secretary of the Interior and would do this a lot. Madam Facilitator, here's what I think we ought to do. He was an expert on process. Um, an expert on substance, and a complete resistor to creative ideas. Y'all know what I want. I don't need to put an idea on the table. Y'all know what I want. Turns out y'all didn't know what he wanted, and he wasn't satisfied with the way other people were guessing at what he did want. Um, other personalities, uh, the wild horse folks were, um, maybe didn't quite have an incentive to deal. I don't think they were really sure what they were doing at the table. Um, and were so passionate about wild horses and how special and wonderful they are, were unable or unwilling to entertain any solution other than, y'all just let them be. <laughs> um, that is a very tricky thing to, to bring to the conversation when no matter what anyone else says, your answer is, yeah, no. Oh, sorry, nope. Nope, 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 nope. Um, part of that was an incentive to deal piece. Part of that was just, I think, the personalities of those two particular people. Um, so, creativity. I was not the facilitator of New Coast, except for, for like two meetings at the very end. Remember, I started here as an intern working for the Wilderness Society. And then um, uh, when I went to work for the Keystone Center, I was sort of the associate staff support person for the gal who was facilitating this. That gal, who is an amazing facilitator, didn't know jack diddly about natural resource management. All of her previous projects were in chem weapons, demilitarization, in um, toxic site cleanup, and she rocked those topics. What she was not prepared for was to be the person who offered creative solutions on a natural resource plan because she didn't know what the rules were, didn't know all the authorizing legislation, didn't know the ways that you can trade things off and how you could build some of those interest-based integrative solutions. Um, so we would drive home for meetings and she'd be like, so remind me what the this and such means? And oh, someone said this, what does that mean? I'm like, dude, I shouldn't be teaching you this, it's this terrible. Um, 
and so because we had tricky personalities, some of whom didn't really have the right incentive, and we didn't have a facilitator who could provide creative, creative solutions, we didn't get a lot of creative ideas. We got a whole lot of, oh yeah, let's just divide that up like this, or maybe, ooh, like that. When we were really creative, we thought, you know, divide it laterally instead of vertically. Um, some people thought about directional drilling to get to the oil and gas that was underneath all the pretty stuff on the surface. Um, but that was about as creative as folks were able to get, I think, because they didn't really want to, because um, they had the incentive thing, and there was no one else to say, well, have you all thought about this? Um, so integration here was actually, it, it, it helped. All those pieces are, in fact, intertwined. Um, the, how you protect the, the natural resources is, is directly intertwined with where and how you do um, natural gas extraction and drilling, is directly related to where you want to put your hikers and your bikers, is directly related to um, if you're going to do timber management, where you would want to do that. All those pieces are so related, we should have been able to come up with a creative solution if we'd had the, the personalities and the skills at the table to do that. It was in some ways set up to succeed, and in other ways set up to fail. Um, agency capacity. BLM, in this case, was interesting. They had great staff who were not participating in the conversation, but mostly there to observe. If you're familiar with federal agencies, they can be um, hamstrung by something called FACA, um, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which says that there are these really strict, super specific rules about how federal agencies can receive guidance and suggestions from stakeholders. And you have to, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy complicated. And most federal agencies say, instead of doing that, we'll just not ask anybody because it's easier. There are a couple ways to do a, what we call a FACA workaround, FACA WAG, FACA workaround group. Um, and one way you can do a FACA WAG is to have someone else, a third party neutral, convene the conversation so that BLM is not the one that's actually saying, y'all come and give me advice. Because if they do, then they have to follow those other rules. But if I do it or someone like me does it, there's a little bit more wiggle room on the rules. Um, but BLM was, was really paranoid about their FACA exposure, and so they did not participate in the conversation. Lovely, fine people all, not, really, not great contributors to the conversation. Um, politics we talked about, clear rules. We had them, we had a list, protocols, it was maybe what, 15 pages, 20 pages, very, very long. Um, there was one sticky wicket in the clear rules on this one, which I have learned from. You all gonna write, wanna write this down. You do not wanna have a stakeholder group whose members are not clearly defined. What we had in New Coast was, if you wanna be a part of this conversation, you are a part of it. Y'all come. It was great. 40, 45 people would turn out at a meeting. That is great if you're seeking input. That is not great if you're seeking agreement. Too many people, and they would change. You know, someone's daughter would get married, she wouldn't come to a meeting for a couple of weeks. Um, the wild horse folks showed up at the very, very end. They actually weren't in this conversation for the first year. Then someone told them, hey, they're doing a, a resource management plan out there in Craig. Oh, crap. And they just showed up at the end, and they were like, oh, no, and by the way, no. And we had nothing to say. Well, you can't just show up and do that. The protocols said, don't talk to the politicians, but you know, show up if you want, I guess. Um, so one of the things that I do now in my clear rules is, if we're going to do consensus make decision making, consensus based decision making, I need to know who all the parties are up front. We all decide. That can still be 40 if it needs to be 40, but I need to know who they are. They need to know who they are, and everyone needs to know who they all are sort of across those lines. Otherwise, just sheer chaos. I just took over a different project on forestry where uh, my first question was, who are the parties? And they're like, oh, anyone who wants to be is a party. No, no, stop this, people. Very, very tricky. Um, so the facilitator was very skilled facilitator, lacked the content knowledge to be the, the sort of the creative impetus um, for solutions. Um, so long and short of that one is, was it a success? Opinions vary widely. There was, in fact, no agreement. By the time I took over this project, I took it over in time to say, y'all aren't going to come to an agreement. I think we should stop pretending that that's the case. And then I sort of broke up the group. Um, I know many of the people now who were part of that group. I'm still friends with them, or at least professionally connected to them. And what many of them will say is substantive failure. There was no agreement. 
but wow, did we build relationships in this conversation. I got to know the people on the other side of all the aisles. And now, when I have a question or a problem, I just call them directly. And these are the same people who, when I worked for Wilderness Society, told me, that's not what we do here. It turned out that maybe that wasn't what they did there because they didn't know who to do that there with. And now they built these relationships with people, the energy companies, and across those lines. And now they call up and they say, so is there a way we can solve this problem before I have to see you in court? And you see now the Wilderness Society in particular very active outside of the courts, seeking collaborative solutions with parties on all kinds of topics, which is spectacular. Um, OK, so that's my new coast story. This is my federal agency. Now, outcomes from this one. The new coast story gets around a fair amount in federal resource circles. What many agencies have learned from that example and others like it, both at BLM and Forest Service in particular, is that collaborative building of resource management alternatives is, is destined to fail. It is very costly, which it is, is very time consuming, which it is, and we will still get sued, which you probably will. Because even if you say, y'all come, some of y'alls won't come. And then later, say you have a y'all come, everyone comes, they come to a nice agreement. And BLM tries to make that agreement the official um, preferred alternative for their resource management area. Um, and then someone shows up way, way, way after the game and says, no, 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 not that. You didn't consider my sweet idea. Well, right, but your sweet idea wasn't actually at the table when we were looking for sweet ideas. Doesn't matter. I will still sue you. And they do. So agencies have learned, unfortunately, that they don't like this. Some still do it, um, but they're more gun shy than they used to be. So my current Forest Service project is a, is a Forest Service management plan. They are not seeking a stakeholder group to come together and advise them and come up with a, with a, a specific alternative for the plan. What they're doing instead is very interesting. We just finished a round of 30 public meetings asking the public to help us understand what they value on the resource. Um, what's important to them, for special places, as well as where they've seen problems. No solution talk, just what do we like, what problems have we seen. Um, next, we're going to have more public meetings. These are y'all come, anyone can show up, break people up into small groups and ask them to help explore ways you could solve the problem. So what do you think we ought to do? It turns out we have 300 miles of trails and we can only manage 100. We have to close 200 miles of trails. Stakeholders, talk amongst yourselves. Which ones would you close? The Forest Service doesn't agree, doesn't promise that they're going to do whatever people talk about. They're just trying to get the ideas, have people hear each other, share the whys, those interests behind the positions, and generate lots of ideas from a collaborative conversation instead of trying to generate one idea from a collaborative conversation. Fundamentally different approach. And then the, re the staff who have the resource expertise there at the Forest Service are going to look through all those options that come from the community, mix and match them into some alternatives for um, what to put in the plan, what to explore further. Anyone can come. If no one comes, wouldn't that be interesting? The expectation, we're starting this, we think, in January. The expectation is that some people will come a lot in the beginning and then kind of peter out, and you'll probably get to a pretty solid group of 20-ish people who will continue to engage on multiple topics over time. Those people will start to do the trade-offs across the topics, that integration. But um, they don't have to agree. And the Forest Service makes no promise to that effect. Um, what I like about this is that it lowers the stakes of participation for all the agency, or for all the participants. They don't have to put the flag in and hold a hard line. Save all the wild horses, because there's not one solution. They can say, be great if you could save all the wild horses. And we go, OK, that's good. Are there other things we could do with the horses? You can push them to think, what if we did this? And what if we did this? No one's writing anything down. We're just talking here, people. Chill out. And they, it, it, it creates this, a safer environment for the, the what if, the exploratory conversation, the creativity. I'll tell you next year if you ask me back how that worked out. Um, but I'm excited about it because it's different. Um, interestingly, the guy whose vision that was at the Forest Service just left and went to another forest. So what I'm not sure of is come January, is my new client at the Forest Service going to be as excited about that approach to the plan revision as the last guy? So I could come back you know, and tell you, yeah, it turns out the new, the new person, gal, guy, whatever it might be, 
said, no, 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 we're just going to do what we want to do and do standard federal decide, announce, defend because it's cheaper. They could do that. So I don't know. Stay tuned. OK. This is the West Trail Study Area in Boulder. Um, city of Boulder snuggled right up there against the Flatiron Mountains, ever so lovely. Um, they decide they're going to do a, stake, a seated stakeholder group to help them come up with a resource management plan for what's called the West Trail Study Area. This is basically all the pretty stuff west of Boulder right there um, in the foothills. Lots of beautiful forest, bouncy nice trails, lots of wonderful habitat, and the, the private backyards of all the fine people in the city of Boulder. Um, a facilitator who was not me helped them come up with their clear rules. There was a long, complicated story at the beginning that I won't bore you with about how they got their name set of stakeholders going into that. But there were named seats. So clear rules. There will be named seats. Everyone will come. Clear goal. We're going to come up with a plan. Again, lots of people trying to get to one idea. Um, folks here had an awesome incentive to deal because everyone, all the stakeholders, thought that the City of Boulder open space staff was completely in alignment with whoever they disagreed with. So all the enviros were 100% sure that the city had already decided just to pave the whole thing for mountain bikes and call it good. And the mountain bikers were 100% sure that the city had already decided there would be no mountain bikes and that they were completely in bed with the enviros. Because everyone distrusted the city, Everyone had believed that they could cut a better deal for themselves than the city would cut for them. So like, I'm going to come to the table and I'm going to fight the good fight and I'm going to get as much of my thing as I possibly can. Um, so they had an incentive to deal. It wasn't a great one, but they had one. Um, personalities, if you've been to Boulder. Um, what is great about Boulder is, I don't know if you know this, highest per capita education in the country. Um, everyone in Boulder is an expert in everything. Um, they are experts in process. They are experts in substance. They are experts in policy, history, future, foretelling, all such things. Um, there was not one person in that group who didn't sit me down privately to tell me, I just need to tell you how it is. Just, you should write this down. Just, here's the answer. So they all knew the answer. They were all very, very tricky. And small town politics, half of them had been on city council, and others of them um, knew a city council person. Um, so the goal here was to basically figure out where you're going to put your mountain bikes, where you're going to put your dogs, where you're going to put your no dogs, where we're going to hike, what we're going to close off to all of that stuff for natural resource protection, quick and dirty. That's how they did that. That was, that was the goal. Um, tricky personalities, trying to do that. And we had, good, we had good issue integration on that one. Again, like with the BLM thing, um, if you're going to close off a thing for dogs, it turns out that's a great place to, you can still allow hikers, and you can still do resource protection because hikers aren't quite as impactful on the resource as people with dogs or people on bikes. So you can build some of those mutually acceptable solutions um, in a situation like this. Agency capacity at the time, um, my client was a planner who was a nervous Nelly hand wringer, lovely person, but every day the sky was falling. And as these personalities ramped up the drama and the conflict, which they did impressively, um, flapped. Not like, OK, how are we going to solve this? But it was like, oh my god, this guy is falling all the time. Um, turns out not helpful. Um, the other more interesting aspect of, of this particular agency is internal to the agency, there is the same divide that exists in the city of Boulder. They are not, they don't have an organizational culture of we're going to work together to figure out how to balance these interests on the landscape. They have teams. They have the resource people and they have the recreation people. They literally don't like each other. They work in different buildings. They don't talk. They compete. That is their culture. Um, so that wasn't much help here because it turns out those same divided staff people who were to differing degrees allied with some of these sticky personalities also, we're talking in back channels to city council. Because again, small town, everybody knows someone. So what you had is, here I am in this room trying to boss these stakeholders to be reasonable. And they followed you know, direction to different, differing degrees. And then they would go out and tell the staff people, here's what council needs to know is happening. And then staff people, who weren't subject to our very clear rules that thou shalt not do that, they would go to council 
and they would tell council what council she worried about, and then council would call the director of the department and say, what the hell is happening over there? And then I would show up at a meeting with you know, crazy you know, flappy pants over here who'd be like, I just got new direction from up high. And my question was always, I'm sorry, from who? Came down from the director. Really? But literally this, one day the direction was, we got to find a place for mountain bikes. Two weeks later, new direction. There shall be no places for mountain bikes. I'm sorry. <laughs> so now our goal, kind of shifting, kind of less clear, because of the politics and the personalities and the agency dynamic. Very tricky. Um, incidentally, I've now been hired by the city of Boulder to help them um, address some of these internal issues in that same department because they figured out that's not working. Um, so there were clear rules eventually. Again, there's a story about how things got set up that was, it was tricky there. Um, the facilitation piece is interesting. I was this group's second facilitator. Um, their first facilitator was a colleague of mine at the Keystone Center. He was the one that helped them design the whole process. He is a very well thought of person in our field. And the client and the group hated him. Um, he is a maybe a typical Boulderite, very right about things, very confident, and not particularly flexible. So um, wh what people reported to me, I can't verify because it wasn't there, um, was the client wanted to do this, and he would say, no, 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 this is the right way to do stuff. Right here. Here's how we, here's how we do facilitation and collaboration. Right here. But, well, yeah, that, but we're trying to get this other thing, so could we just be over here a little bit? No, no, no. Here. So the client found him very rigid and not willing to flex the process to meet their needs, and the stakeholder groups found him um, to be um, overly rigid in how he thought they should engage. Um, some reported to me that they thought he was condescending at a know-it-all. Um, I don't have an opinion about any of that, but what I do know is when the facilitator is in conflict with the client and the group, the facilitator must go. Don't fight the group. Number one rule, don't fight the group. Um, so eventually, the city of Boulder um, freed that person from um, this particular hell that he was in. And they hired me. Um, I have a completely, like two more different facilitators than me and that guy you'd have a hard time finding. Um, the group, I think, found me to be a breath of fresh air. I was able to help them with some of the creative solutions. But my style was in conflict with their clear rules. The clear rules that I would write are, clear are different than the clear rules that he wrote. So I would say things like, well, what do you say we do this sweet thing way over here? And they would say, they would use their rules against me and be like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. We have the rules. The rules say we don't do that. And I'd be like, oh, bummer. But what about this? And they would say, no, sorry, rules, can't do that. Um, so my ability to be the creative um, force in that group was to some degree stymied by the clear, clear rules that they had. That sucked. Um, so politics ended up affecting the sex success. Here's what happened. I rode that group and I rode them hard and I got them to an agreement. And they resisted it until they didn't. And then there was this moment at the end where they just came to this huzzah agreement that was spectacularly um, gratifying to see. And then staff took that agreement and they made a plan out of it and they took that plan to city council. Whoa, but remember all those people who were talking to city council? They showed up during public comment and said that the agreement was wrong for any number of reasons. Primarily it was on their uh, dogs were being, I'm paraphrasing a little bit snarkily, diminished. Dogs were being diminished by this agreement. There weren't enough opportunities for dogs. Um, and council in about 15 minutes overturned two years of collaboration, threw out um, a pretty foundational piece of the group's agreement and then approved the plan without that piece in it. Um, people in that group pissed, pissed off. What they later reported at our celebration after we were going to have a party, right? Council's going to adopt the plan. We're, we're partying. Oh my god, they were so bummed. We wasted that time. They never cared what we wanted to think anyway. Um, I will never ever commit my time to a process like that again. Um, so hey agencies, here's my advice. If you don't care what they think, don't ask them. Hey, politicians, here's my advice. 
honor the agreements of your collaborative groups or don't empower them to do the work. But don't empower them and then overturn them. It's bad. Incidentally, OSMP, the Open Space and Mountain Parks um, Department in Boulder, also learned an important lesson here. Same one we learned here. Don't ask a bunch of stakeholders to get together and find an agreement, on one, come to one big agreement. That's expensive. It takes too much time. We're going to get sued anyway. People are going to be pissed. Um, so now we're doing the North TSA. And they have hired me to help them with, again, a fundamentally different process. What they said, I was already doing this process over here with the Forest Service when they called me and they said, we don't want to do that other thing. What else do you got? And I said, what are we trying to accomplish? And they said, we, want, we, wa we really want people's ideas, but we don't want to get in that box we got in last time where we had to do what they said. Um, so how can we balance those two things? And basically, with the staff, I came up um, with a riff on what the Forest Service was doing over on the, in, in, in the Forest Service project. So now, where I am now with the North TSA, with City of Boulder, we had stakeholders come together, tell us what they liked, what they wanted to see changed. Um, had three big meetings where I asked everyone to tell me what their position was, what they wanted to see in the North TSA, and then I said, thank you very much for sharing and tell me what your interest is. Um, I had one person writing down positions on paper where no one can see it. So we had those, because maybe there's a good idea in there, I don't know. Um, but then I had someone else writing the interests on big chart paper in front of the group, because it turns out a lot of overlap on the interests. And then we use those interests. Now they're going to be criteria. And staff is now working on developing five-ish draft scenarios. And I'm in facilitating the internal conversation with staff about, so staff, remember, they're divided. They don't like each other. How are y'all going to do the thing that we want the public to do? How are you going to work across the lines to find multiple scenarios that meet all these interests? They talk amongst themselves. They do a bunch of yes ifs and what ifs and hell no's. And then I say, OK, so we have an idea. How does this scenario meet the community interest that we heard? Whoops, we missed one. And then we go back. So now we're in this internal conversation, developing these scenarios. And then the plan is the scenarios go out to the public next month. And we're going to ask the public, so what do you think? How do you think these scenarios meet the interests that you, told, that, that, that you identified? And if they don't, tell us how you would change them so they do. Not tell me what your position is and how, if you were left to be in charge of all things, what you would do to manage this land, but how would you change this, this scenario to better achieve all the interests, not just yours? Um, what, I don't know how, again, I don't know how that story is going to end either. Um, but I can tell you that so far, the dynamic in the conversation is fundamentally different than what we had in the West TSA because we made that interest-based switch, um, which I would have probably done here if I had been in at the front end, but I wasn't. Um, he had a different plan, which wasn't a bad plan. It just wasn't, you know, my plan. Um, but community is responding really well. They're being really creative. There's much, people are being much more agreeable. Um, so far, council has not been involved, particularly um, we've had a couple cases of end running, um, but fewer, and um, I'm optimistic about that one. Okay, this is the Fountain Creek Vision Task Force. This is a regional, so here we have federal, municipal, this is a regional group. Um, this, is my, this is my very, very, very first big girl project. It's very near to my heart. Um, Fountain Creek is a lovely stream that starts sort of up in the mountains outside of Colorado Springs, trickles down through Colorado Springs, and then runs down into Pueblo, and then joins as a trib to the Arkansas River, and then heads out um, east. And um, it's lovely. It floods like the Dickens. And when it floods, it floods um, in the um, minority and uh, economically disadvantages disadvantaged communities of Pueblo. Um, it also washes away Target on um, some regularity because they built in the floodplain. So I don't know if you know anything about um, Colorado politics, but Pueblo County and El Paso County, which is where Colorado Springs is, are sort of your Hatfields and McCoys. They hate each other. Here's how you know. When you're driving down I-25, uh, when you come into Colorado Springs, into El Paso County, there's a sign that says, welcome to El Paso County. Um, Ronald Reagan Highway. And then you drive all the way through El Paso County and you get over here to 
Pueblo County, welcome to Pueblo County, John F. Kennedy Highway. <laughs> um, forever at odds goes back to who was going to be the capital of Colorado back when people were trying to decide who was going to be the capital of Colorado. Big drama. Um, so it turns out that people in Pueblo believe that Fountain Creek floods um, because uh, people in Colorado Springs don't care about them, primarily. Um, it's an impervious surface issue. It's a runoff issue. It's a stormwater problem, um, which is exacerbated by the fact that where Colorado Springs Utilities that serves um, the drinking water and also does um, wastewater treatment, I do that right there on Fountain Creek. And so when it floods, not only does it flood through your house, through your target, through your streets, whatever, it brings along a fair amount of E. coli with it. Um, so we have kids who are playing in the floodwaters who are getting these nasty infections on their legs because there's a cut and there's a, it's, it, yeah, that face, exactly. It's gross. A um, lot of drama, a lot of blaming. Um, they asked me if I would come and facilitate a thing. And I said, I do love a good thing because I'm new. What thing are we doing? And they did not know. Um, we want to do something together to solve this Fountain Creek problem. We Pueblo County Commissioners and we El Paso County Commissioners. Yay. Great. What kind of thing are we going to do? We're going to collaborate. Yeah, I got that. But toward what end? We don't know. This is my first project. I'm like, OK, let's do that. Um, I don't know that I knew enough then to ask the question harder than I did. I was like, OK, let's, let's, let's talk. We shall. And so we did. So we did not have a clear goal. Um, but we did have a lot of incentives for the parties to negotiate. Um, El Paso County would like to not be sued by Pueblo County for, being, um, out, for operating outside the permits of their stormwater, outside the, the, the parameters of their stormwater permit. Um, Colorado Springs Utilities is very concerned about the E. coli issue, which, by the way, they later D DNA tested the E. coli, because you can do that. Not human from the wastewater treatment plant, pigeon from up in the mountains, just FYI. Um, Pueblo County obviously has an incentive to negotiate because they would like their town to stop flooding. Enviro's at the table, they want to, there's some nice uh, wetlands in the area, some um, bird migratory corridors, other such things that they're trying to maximize and connect. Um, other parties similarly committed to this thing called collaboration. To what end, no one knows. Personalities here were largely a non-issue. People were lovely, just lovely. I had to boss them a fair amount. I mean, they're, you know, they're parties in conflict, so they're not at their best. No one's bringing sunshine and cookies to the conversation. But you didn't have any of the grandstanding and the no because no. They were, they were, they were chill. They were just there, like, we're going to solve this problem, man. They were great. Um, some of them were really creative. I was not able to be creative in this one, my first project. Um, also my first water project. And if you're new to water, here's what happens. I have a great idea. Sorry, that's illegal. I have another great idea. Sorry, that's illegal. And water stuff often gets hamstrung by Colorado water law, which is extremely rigid, non-flexible, specific, and hugely unhelpful in collaborative problem solving. Um, so you had the water law thing. You had the Heather's an idiot in his new thing. Um, but we had uh, a guy who worked for the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, who was an environmental planner, who just thought creatively, just sort of those people who you know, doodles wonderful things while he's listening to you and then has this awesome idea. Um, there was an environmentalist from the Trust for Public Lands who had a vision that she brought to bear. Um, but ultimately, there were two people who had an incentive to deal. One worked for Colorado Springs Utilities, and the other one worked for the Lower Arkansas um, Valley uh, Water Conservancy District. Um, the floodwaters had his way full of E. coli, which he would like to not then give to his farmers and ranchers to put on their fields. So he's excited to fix this problem um, so that he's giving better water and more um, time-managed water to his constituents. So they have an incentive to deal. And the two of them, with the environmental planner guy um, and the environmentalist, would come to meetings and just start saying things like, what if we did this? I have a vision. 
And other people would say, because remember, they're all nice now. This is a very lovely group. Ah, we could do that. Sure, why not? We don't understand the problem. So we spend a lot of time in this group understanding the problem. Lots of expert panels, um, lots of people coming in and giving their perspectives, uh, uh, a fair amount of dueling scientists. Um, but in the end, they were very creative. They leveraged the good personalities of people. And because what they, what they brought were ideas and visions, what we ended up creating, our, our, our goal that we didn't know at the beginning, that we knew at the end, was to come up with a, a, a strategic plan, basically, for restoration of the watershed. They spent two years learning about what the issues were, two years of what if we did this, and then we took the what if we did this, we put that at the end, and then I said, if y'all want to do that, what do you need to do when and by whom to get there? And then we just reverse engineered from there a strategic plan that said, city X will do this thing in year one and year two and year three, city Y will do these things in these years, um, federal government will do this, and a lot of to-dos, this nice thick plan. Um, and one of the things they came up with at the very end was uh, this idea of what if we create a watershed management district, which you have to go to the legislature for, and um, if you have a, such a district, it can then levy taxes and use those taxes for projects that achieve the end of whatever your district was created to achieve. So they did that. They created the Fountain Creek Flood Control and Greenway District um, with, with a unanimous vote um, in both the State House and the State Senate. So, was a success. Um, I was there. I was new. I think they liked me because I was new. I kind of bumbled through it and they let me. I don't know if it would have gone differently with a different person, but it, it was fine. I'm not sure how critical I was in that one. Um, remember, I'm new. My rules were clear-ish. Um, I had a clear group of stakeholders in a decision-making body. Um, I had a clear, in my own mind, sense of what consensus was, but we didn't define it in the, in the protocols. Shockingly, because nice people, that was never a problem. It said, we will make decisions by consensus. I never defined what that was. People said, okay, let's do that. When there were decision points, people would go, oh yeah, let's do that, because they're nice, they're very agreeable. Shockingly easy, I thought it was a genius. I thought, whoa, I've got this facilitation thing down, I'm so amazing. Politics weren't much of an issue here. There were some county commissioners that were running um, for re-election on whether or not they helped solve this problem. Um, there was no agency, I had no client here. This is a, an interesting situation on this one. Um, the group reached out to me sort of diffusely and the way that we funded it, instead of having a client foot the bill, everyone kicked in money to a pot. So there were 27 named parties to the decision-making body. We basically passed a hat, each party according to his ability. Um, counties kicking in like five grand. There was a rancher at the table who kicked in 50 bucks. Um, so the first year was funded through that shared pool. The second year was funded through a grant from the state of Colorado. I still really have no client which is so awesome because I can do whatever I want. Not so awesome when I have questions. Should we zig or should we zag? Should we X or should we Y? Um, and I'm new, so I had a lot of those questions. No one to provide me that guidance. Um, nice people, bumbled through, got to a successful outcome. But happy accident more than reliable pattern. Um, politics, integration, we were very integrated there. So this went swimmingly. They have this plan, they have their district, they populate the district with a board, they have a citizens advisory group, they have a technical advisory group. Everything is just wonderful. And um, nothing happens, literally nothing. They start having these meetings, I'm done now, I've moved on to other things, they're not, they have a chairman, woman of the board, who facilitates the meetings. Later they hire a director, that person facilitates the meetings, and they do nothing. They're so excited about their plan and their district, they just sat on their laurels. Meanwhile, doesn't stop raining. Fountain Creek still floods to this day. This year, epic, awful, awful flood. Um, Colorado Springs trying to build a sweet uh, pipeline uh, that has to cut through Pueblo. Pueblo has uh, permitting authority over that under 1041 rules of the state of Colorado, which are complicated, but basically they can say no. And if they say no, there's not a lot of recourse. Um, and Pueblo's 
super pissed. One thing that did come out of our process was Pueblo, our city of Colorado Springs had passed a stormwater, I want to say tax fee, can't remember, um, in order to get a lot of money to do some infrastructure improvements to stop the stormwater from running off, detention ponds, um, things like that. And Doug Bruce, who lives in El Paso County, sued saying that it was an illegal tax because it wasn't um, put to a vote of the people under the rules of Tabor. And so they repealed it. And so then there was no rule in the city of Colorado Springs that had anything to do with getting, getting money to do any of the flood control projects that the people in Pueblo wanted to see, because they were in the plan that no one was doing anything with, incidentally. Um, and so the city of Pueblo and Pueblo County said, hey, Colorado Springs, if you're not going to do your part to stop the flooding, we're going to pull our permit permission for your sweet pipeline. And they are stuck there right now. They have been stuck there for eight months, maybe a year, depending on who you ask. Dead stalemate. No one knows what to do. Colorado Springs City Council has no interest in passing a flood control management policy fee, tax, anything. Pueblo still, fl fl um, still flooding, still pissed about that. Um, they're going to now, they're talking about suing the city of Colorado Springs over um, the uh, stormwater management permit that they get from the state of Colorado. And that is such a disappointment to me. I have many of the people that were so nice up here in other groups, and they are so discouraged and just diminished by the outcome of this. And I say, what happened to that thing though? We were so happy. We had our plan, everyone was on board, and they were like, yeah, no leadership, no champions. It turns out the lack of politics there might have actually been an impediment to this one. Because there was no one to stand up and say, we must do this. They had people in Pueblo who were running on it, but no one in Colorado Springs who was equally passionate. All the passion in Colorado Springs was at the technician level, staff internal to the city, staff internal to the, to the utility, um, but no real leadership high up who were going to be um, who are going to fight the public fight for a tax, for management, for pulling their weight and doing their part. So lack of politics made it easier for me to get to an agreement. They just pretty much sailed to that agreement. But it turned out that the agreement was fairly hollow because there was no one um, to fight for it. And so the outcome there is less encouraging. And um, again, stay tuned. Yep. Hi, Catherine, what's your question? Hi, um, so you had, you had said that in your first example that there were clear rules and there was not a clear penalty for if anyone broke it. Uh huh. And then in example two, the rules were so rigid that you couldn't really dampen your creativity. Can you talk about how you enforce rules, maybe what you work with, and use the first two examples that being so different? I can, it's kind of a long answer. You want me to try it? Oh yeah, I can, oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, so um, the way that I enforce the rules, first of all, is I have the group create the rules, and then I say to the group, are we agreed that these are our shared rules? Yes. Are we agreed that it is my job to enforce these rules? Yes. And then I say, so then I'm going to expect no one to give me static when I come back to you about enforcing these rules. And they say, okay. So first I have to have their permission to enforce the rules. When they break the rules, um, sometimes it comes out in a meeting, which is awkward. Usually someone calls me and say, it says, like high school telephone, oh my god, Billy told me that Mary told him in French class that so-and-so was doing this and such a thing. Um, and then I talk to parties offline. And I feel like one of my jobs is to, um, to the best of my ability, not embarrass anyone in a meeting so they bring their best selves, their most powerful selves to the conversation. So then I call people offline and I say, so I heard that you did this. Yeah, is that true? Yeah, yeah, it's true. And here's why I did it, Heather. Appreciate your why. However, did you know that that was against the protocols? <gasps> yeah, yeah, I did. Um, but here's why I did it. I'm like, yep, get that you did it. Sounds like you did know why. 
they have two options. If we have a rule that says we can drum them off the group, I can say, you know I have the authority to drum you off the group. I don't want to do that. It sets a bad precedent and leaves a bad feeling in people's mouths. Usually what I will say is, rather than do that, what do you say you own up to your mistake in front of the whole group and apologize and see if they are willing to forgive you? I have the authority to drum you off the group, but I'm not going to do it without the will of the rest of the group behind me. Because remember, don't fight the group. Um, so that person would come to the group and say, so I did this. I'm really sorry. I had these reasons, or I thought it was OK, or I didn't really know the rule, or I had my head up my ass, whatever that might be. And then um, I say to the group, what do we think? And usually someone in the group will say, I think this one's OK. Dude, don't do it again. Groups tend to be very forgiving, particularly if it's late in a process when they've built a lot of collaborative um, enthusiasm for one another. In my West TSA process, we did drum two people off that group for breaking the, uh, breaking the rules. Um, and that was an effort that I resisted and that the group, the rest of the group, was behind wholeheartedly. So then I said, if y'all are all there, I'm there with you. I talked to those people offline and tried to make it elegant where they stepped down instead of the group having to have a big moment publicly that says we're drumming you off. Um, so that's how I enforce them. It helps if you have the what if we do this thing wrong. Um, in my West TSA group, the protocols um, were very rigid. They laid out the whole process and the, the, the steps in the process so that if I said, Here's what we should do. We should have small groups, and you should come up with five different solutions, and then we'll compare them. Or you'll work in teams, and you'll do this. Like, nope, nope, sorry. Protocols say that we're doing step one, step two, step three. That is neither one, two, or three. We're not doing that. Um, what I could have done is say, we need to rethink about the protocols. They're, too, they're, they're constraining our creativity. Um, but knowing how hard they had fought their last facilitator, I was reluctant to take that risk. I thought that the risk did not um, merit the potential reward. And so I decided to roll with the will of the group. My style is to roll with the will of the group. Other people is not. Um, I don't know that I made the right choice in that process. Maybe I should have pushed harder, got them to rethink that, and maybe they would have had a better outcome. I don't know. Does that help? Catherine, is that good? Okay. <laughs>